Good evening, everyone, and you're very welcome to our Back to School webinar this evening. My name is Eta Murphy, and I'm the coordinator of the Wellbeing Network West Cork, and we're delighted to be hosting the event, and thank you all for joining us this evening. The Wellbeing Network, we're based in the National Learning Network in Bantry, and we work very closely with the HSC Health and Wellbeing section. And we encourage and support individuals, families and communities to be proactive in looking after their health and well-being. Last August, we ran a webinar called Back to School um, in much the same theme as this evening to offer parents advice and support and an opportunity for discussion around the challenges at that stage in terms of schools reopening in September. I think we're in a very different vista now um, in August. I suppose there was a definitive reopening date. And while there were concerns and anxieties over the new protocols that be in place, the social distancing, the masks, etc., I think there was a nervous excitement and anticipation of some sort of return to normality and the structure and routine that schools give to families. Uh, today, I suppose the difference is there isn't clarity on when schools were reopening, there are dates being talked about and talks of a phased reopening. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there, uh, particularly in the secondary school arena for exam students and leaving certs where there's options being discussed, but no definitive or decisions or clarity as yet, albeit we may get that later this week. So I think it'd be fair to say there's a lot of stress um, concern out there not just among parents, but in general. And I know a lot of people are saying to me, this lockdown is probably the toughest, most challenging time they've had so far in this pandemic. We decided it would be good to revisit the sort of schools and parents a webinar we did last August and uh, reconvene our panel. So we hope this evening that you'll have an opportunity to share your concerns, ask questions, we won't be able to answer them all because there will be questions there are simply not answers to, but we hope to leave you with some insights, some support and encouragement, and hopefully a bit of a lift in terms of you know homeschooling, dealing with everyone at home and not knowing when schools may reopen for your children. Uh, a couple of practical things I just want to address. Um, it might be useful to select the grid view or the um, gallery view like in Zoom as the discussion will be very much kind of a to and fro between the panelists. So it might be good just to have all the panelists up on screen rather than speaker view. Please, please ask your questions, anything that comes to mind that you've been thinking about before the event this evening and that comes up during the discussion. There's a Q&A section, type in your question there. If you want to address it to a particular panelist, just note that and we will get through as many questions as we can. If for any reason your connection goes down or you lose the link to the webinar, just go back to the email that I sent you with the link and you should be able to join again. So um, if you drop out, you should be able to get back into the event. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our panel this evening. We're joined by Sarah Buckley. She's the principal of Skull Community College. It's a mixed secondary school in Skull. I think about 370 students. Uh, we have Bart Harrington from Skullnabukli in Clannacilty. It's a boys' primary school with 260 students. We have Nolig McSqueeny. Nolig is a behavioural therapist and she works with children and adolescents and their families through periods of stress and anxiety. So thank you so much for coming back to us again to the panel this evening and uh, giving us their time. Our MC this evening is Sean Mahan. Sean is the managing director of the Southern Star newspaper. Um, he is the father of a teenager who is due to do the Leaving Cert this year, so I think he knows only too well the impact of all of the uncertainty that's happening. And um, he's also on the board of management of a primary school, so a lot of these things are very close to his heart, I'm sure. So, Sean, thank you for joining us again this evening, and I'm going to hand over to you to get things started. Uh, from, from myself as well. Um, it's great to be back. I, we got a lot of very positive feedback from the session that took place last August, which does seem like a very, very long time ago. So uh, good, good to be back, uh, and, and hopefully we can we can uh, provide some useful information, some useful answers uh, from our panel uh, this uh, this evening. So, so maybe without further ado, I might just get the ball rolling, and, and we'll, we'll we'll just get a bit of feedback from our from our panelists. I suppose the point that myself and and Anita have, have just alluded to, and we're all very conscious of, is that this lockdown 
feels very different to where we were uh, when we were on the last webinar back in August. It feels like it's going on for longer. It feels like it's more severe. It's during the winter months. The weather hasn't been good. I guess just from your own perspective, even comparing now to where we were back in um, back in last August, what what are the kind of things that you're picking up from 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 parents or from your students or, or or even from your staff? I just wonder whether each of you might just have a an insight or a bit of feedback that that would be useful to to, to share with with people who are online with us tonight. Um, maybe maybe Sarah, you might you might be happy to to kick off with that one. Um. Yeah. Um. So. I suppose I'll start with a positive, actually. Um, one of the things that we've been picking up on from our students, from our parents, and from our teachers, I suppose online learning this time around is working better. I suppose we we closed last March. It was very unexpected. We were very unprepared. And an awful lot of work has gone into getting ready for this potential happening again. And I suppose we, we, we kind of start back to school but um, it was going reasonably well. I'm a bit complacent, thinking, gosh, we're, 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 we're running, we're, we're doing okay. We'll back after Christmas, but we did have good plans in place. So I think um, they're working better. You know, you, you're seeing a lot of things like live classes, which wouldn't have been happening last time. So I think that part of it is working really well. But I think you've captured the other side of it, which um, I'm certainly feeling, but I, I families and, and my staff feeling it as well, which is it's dark, the days are short, um, it's going on for a long time. And that is hard, it's certainly harder. And um, with any sense of when this is going to be over, it, it, it's difficult and I, and I and you can definitely feel that when you're talking to our families indeed and i and i think anything like like the the webinar session we're doing tonight i think there's a danger people can feel maybe slightly isolated um and it's good therefore if we can you know people can share experiences and feel that, that they're kind of all in this together um uh, bart anything from from your perspective on on this kind of second uh extended wave of lockdown that we're experiencing yeah, I'd like to echo what, what Sarah did, said there a moment ago. I think the only I thought this time was like for the last, for the first three, four weeks, it was very successful and everybody was doing very well. And we were doing, I know we're doing, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of Zooms a week and they were all being very, very good. But I thought last week people were starting to flag a small bit and people are getting a bit tired. And I suppose they, like when we were doing it the last time, we had the summer holidays. We were all looking forward to summer holidays. That that was going to be the, at the end of it. This time we don't know when we're going to coming back. Even though now I feel we'll be back. Please God, early March. So uh, anyway, we've midterm break on Thursday and Friday, so we're all looking forward to that small thing at the moment. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, and I suppose that's the key point to take out of it. It's maybe trying to always have things to look forward to. So even if it's just yeah. a couple of days off for midterm, yeah, end of this week, that's something to look look forward to. Maybe it's a couple of days off where the kids are not sat on a, a Zoom class, and you know they're they're off school. So it, it's maybe making the most of these kind of small wins that come along um, this week, next week, the week after, and then hopefully we'll get to the big win at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, thanks, Bart. And uh, Nolik, I mean, from your perspective, obviously you 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 deal with with with, with teacher, uh, sorry, with um uh, with children and, and with adults. Would would you be experiencing or any different kinds of of types of anxiety or stress that maybe weren't there before that are coming to the fore now, being referred to you? And and any advice you might have around how to deal with those? Yeah, I suppose at at the moment, which is a little bit different from from previously, I would definitely see an increase in what could be best described as despair and, and a bit of helplessness. Um, and I think we do need to name that, which isn't about diving into the despair and saying it's all terrible and awful. I think people need to hear very clearly, this is rough, rough times. I think there was a bit of novelty amidst the, the chaos of the last time and people were setting tasks and targets and it was very new, but I, I'm finding people are tired. Parents are, are tired. and. On a very positive note, I'm, I'm pleased to hear Sarah and Bart both saying that, that the online schooling is working better, and I'm certainly hearing that. So, you know, there are elements that are definitely improved, but I do think the tiredness, for all the reasons you already pointed out, 
the dark days and, and the uncertainty. I think we're all feeling we should be out of this by now. And I had a very interesting conversation with a young person earlier today who was telling me about her Snapchat memories. And she was like, we had no idea what was coming. And there was a disco on this time last year, and that was the last time they had normality. Yes. I think there's a sadness. It's like, you know, that pre-anniversary grief feeling almost around the place. It's like, we did not know what was coming, mm. but here we are. And I think, you know, there is some good stuff happening. And I think events like this are so important. So people get to hear, you know, that they're not alone. And a lot of people are struggling, but there is some good stuff going mm. on too. And 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 I think I think that's a really interesting point as well. And 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 I was uh, discussing with uh, somebody earlier today in advance of this session tonight. Was and it kind of leads on to that point you were just just making there a little bit, knowledge, which is around the topic of almost um, independence and and independence as in particularly for a certain age group, maybe like the twelve year olds, thirteen year olds, fourteen year olds. This is a time when they are sort of forging their independence. They're exploring, you know, what life is about and. Um, uh, you know, and even you know, uh, you know, meeting the opposite sex, etc., whatever. All these things are a little bit just on hold at the moment. And and and, and you know, is is that something we as parents should be concerned about, or, or or ultimately should we just try and remember that you know, kids are resilient at the end of the day? I mean, any any thoughts around that to to, to reassure parents or how they could yeah. handle that with their children? I think it's both, in fact, Sean. I think we need to recognise that kids are very resilient, far more resilient than we actually give them credit for. But we must also be acutely aware of the fact that a key developmental task of adolescence, which is to move away from family parents and move towards peers and, you know, the excitement and the living that comes with adolescence. And they've not only been deprived of it, they don't know when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. So from a developmental perspective, there is a halt going on. But again, mm -hmm. I would emphasize resilience. And I think once we validate, acknowledge and support where kids are at, they they tend to, to do quite well. So again, it's about parents being mindful of themselves and how to support kids in those scenarios. And, 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 and as you say, trying, trying, to, trying to look forward, look forward to the small wins, trying to look forward now to the weather getting better, trying to look forward to that hopefully this lockdown will end at some point. They will be back at school in the not too distant future. So try and maybe to create a scenario where, you know, touch wood, this is not a forever thing. This is a temporary thing and it will, it will pass um, is what we hope. Um, and maybe just come back to the, uh, to, 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 to the two teachers and, and maybe back to Sarah first. I mean, we touched on here about the, the level of, uh, you know, how everyone's so much better now at, at, at teaching uh, remotely, teaching via Zoom and the, and the kids in terms of taking those lessons and absorbing those lessons uh, remotely. Um, but again, I, I, you know, I, it'd be useful to know if you've got any sort of coping um, tips or advice. So, so I have a 13 year old and it's really interesting now watching the fact that he's on his Zoom classes pretty much for the whole of what would be the normal school day. And it seems to be working very well, but we, you can definitely tell that he's quite, it's a different kind of tiredness at the end of the day. So again, I just wondered whether there was any advice, because you've got a lot more experience in this than I have, about how parents could manage that and help their kids with that side of things. Yeah, um, it's something that we were very aware of when to um, set up our live time to, I suppose, we, um, our core subjects run as normal, but we certainly don't have, and that allows there to be kind of, don't have to be necessary in time. Now that doesn't mean they're not engaged in school work. What we would say to students is you use that time for, um, you know, doing assignments, doing homework. Um, time it's life it's something a balance. So I suppose that's something that school management work on. The other thing that I've been really strongly saying to, to parents is of the days are short getting up in the evening they get start but it's out during the day perhaps um so getting that walk in you know if they have off they have a 40 minutes to get out during the day and to to, to make the most because you know if they leave it until four half four it's quite dark and they don't get to do that so they have to break up that day with coming away from screens but like everything, it's having a good routine, you know, so I do think getting up, getting dressed, 
um, you know, breakfast, being on being at their workspace on time, having their breaks at their normal time, having lunch. I think all of those things are very important. And I I, I have a teenager as well. And mm-hmm. there are some days she's in her pajamas in her bed on her Zoom call. And I, you know, and I know that. <laughs> You know, we're all working from home as parents, you know, so it's not going to be a perfect day every day, but we do our best. And, you know, there'll be days that we're better than other days. But I would say everybody works much better when they're in that routine. They're up, they're dressed, cameras are on, you know, they're engaging classes and they're set during the day. That's the best way to do it. But we're not always going to do that every time. And that's okay too. So, so the takeout would be, you know, have a structure. Try and try and try and make sure there's variety during the day. Don't beat yourself up if it's not a perfect day every day. Um, you know, it's it's it, you've you've just got to go with the ebb and flow a little bit. But try but try and have a core shape and a core structure running through the day or through the week. I think is is probably an important yeah. thing. Sarah, there's a little bit of uh, in and out on your connection. I think. I mean, I'm picking up on that. But um, so I'll, I'll let you know if it gets I worse. Do that really do. Um, well, to prove things, so I think it might a little yeah. bit. Yeah, that 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 might be a good idea. Um, and um, uh, Bart, from 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 your point of view, would you? And look, I, I'm going to ask you the killer question here and put you on the spot. But do do you have any any sense, or do, do you have any inkling about when when this um, much talked about return to school for for primary and obviously for for secondary may may well may well come about. Do you have any inside track on that at all? I think is your is is your mute on Bart. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have no inside track. Just a gut feeling, really. Next Monday, our special classes are coming back. So there's two special classes. There'll be 11 students and there'll be six staff members coming back. I then believe I'd say start of March, I think we'll all be starting to come back. They're talking about a phased return. That hasn't been explained. Some people are saying it'll be infants in sixth class first and then as the weeks roll by, every other class will come back. I'm hoping, well, it would suit our teachers better here if we were, if more classes were back than, than fewer because well, some of our teachers have two and three children at home and I don't know how they're going to be able to come in and also teach at the same time. But I still think I'd say by the, definitely by the end of March, I'd say we'll all be back, if not okay. earlier. Okay. And I think, yeah, the only thing is that there's all different size schools in primary. You know, you've got from 20 to 200 to 400. So like maybe smaller schools could be back a lot, a lot earlier than, than some of the larger schools. That's true. So, so ho- yeah, as you say, hopefully there is light at the end of the tunnel ju- just around the corner. Oh, yeah, particularly and, with the, the spring yeah. days coming. And don't forget, we, we've been only doing this hard to believe for 27 days. It feels a lot longer, <laughs> but it's only 27 days. I think it certainly <laughs> does feel a lot longer yeah, for yeah. Every, everybody involved in yeah. this. Um, and 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 uh, Sarah, I, m- I might just just come back to you, and then and then and then after that, I've got another question, which is one I'd like to put across all the panelists. But just just coming back to to that mention of the leaving cert situation that we touched on a second ago, uh, and look, without getting into all the ins and outs of it, but I think the biggest thing that seems to be I'm picking up on from my own uh, personal situation at home, but other 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 kids involved uh, for the leaving cert is is the is the the uncertainty at the moment about actually. Uh, what is going to happen in terms of the combination of the exam or, or, or the calculated grades or some other other model? Um, and I suppose one of the things that we've tried to discuss at home is, look, at the end of the day, and it's, it sounds a bit glib, but trying to trying to worry just about controlling the controllables and not to try and get too het up at this point about things that are out of your control. And it's easy for me to say because I'm not doing the leaving cert, but any experience of that, sir, with your 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 cohort and and how you're advising them? Absolutely. Look, this is the conversation I've been having with our leaving certs um, back in August. And um, what I say, and it is easy for me as well to say, ignore the media as much as you can, because ultimately you still have to cover curriculum. I say, turn up to class, listen to your teachers and do your homework. And like they're simple things, but you can do those. And it doesn't matter then whether it's the normal search. It doesn't matter that it's calculated 
it doesn't matter what the end um, assessment is, be ready. So it's about getting through the content with the teachers really is what's most important and to focus on that. So, um, you know, and that's hard. I mean, like we can see that, um, you know, when we started online school, um, there was, you know, they, they were brilliant the first couple of weeks, really engaged, assignments in straight away. And yeah, as time has gone on, that engagement is is faltering a little bit. And that's very understandable because they're like, but what's happening? And, and, and that affects them being engaged. But you just have to go back to like what you said, control the controllables. And all control right now is attending class and doing their assignments. That that really is the control we have. No one you have students going, will I have an oral exam? And what their teachers are saying, we're working as if you and even if you don't, the work you've done to you, it doesn't matter. Whatever the assessment will be, it won't be wasted time. And I think that's the thing that we really have to get them to realise that the work they do won't be wasted no matter what the what comes down the line. And the other thing I keep saying to them, we will look after you. You know, there's not a teacher in the country that doesn't want the absolute best for their students. So whatever they throw at us this week, because we have no inside track, like Bart is saying, we don't know. I do think leaving certs will be back from early March. I do. Um, but I don't know that for definite. But no matter what happens, we will do whatever we need to do to get them over the line. And every leaving cert will get over the line. And the vast majority of them will be happy with the outcome. Last year. And, you know, there were students who were disappointed and we do hear about the court cases. But, you know, there was also a much larger percentage of students who were happy, who've gone on to university and who are going to be fine. And, you know, chances are that's who you'll be. So, you know, we need to try and keep sticking with the positives, diffs that, you know. I, I think that's a really good point, isn't it? That, that we, we often... As human beings, we tend to have a leaning towards, uh, you know, what what might happen or might go wrong, or, or, or the, the 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 minority negative bit. But as you say, the vast majority of of people last year or leaving certain students went through fine, and they got to where they went to went wanted to get to, or or a good alternative, uh, yeah. and 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 that's that's the focus. Um, so yeah, no, thank thank thanks for that, Sarah. Um, I, I suppose the next topic I was just going to bring up, which kind of links, and and it'd be interesting to get views uh, across the panel. It links to this point again that we've been discussing that there is so much time obviously being spent at home by our children and everybody else at home. But one of the things that uh, is probably happening is that the kids are spending an, an inordinate amount of time online, not just at the studying side and the remote teaching side, but actually maybe more online than they would normally do because just parents sometimes are just at the wit's end. They've got the wit's raining outside, it's blowing a storm, the kids can't go and play football on the bikes or whatever. So they're sat on the Xbox or they're sat more than they normally would. And, and, and Nolig, I might, I might come back to you on that one. I don't know if this is something that you would have any thoughts or, or, or views around in terms of, I suppose, the two sides of it. One is, one is uh, how parents should, you know, should kind of try and handle this and manage it or, 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 or what, to, what to be careful about. And, and I guess the other side of it about, you know, is, is, there a, is there a correlation between if kids are spending more time online that actually parents do need to just be on the ball a little bit more in terms of child safety and, and, and just keeping an eye on things. Yeah, I suppose there, there is and always has been mixed views about online and how much is too much. And, you know, should parents be very afraid right now, given how much people, young people are online? And what I would say to that is the normal safety rules apply. You do need to know what your kid is up to when online but I also think there's huge value at the minute I mean a lot of young people are using gaming for social connection it might be their primary social connection with their peers um, and I think if it's being used for connection and enjoyment then moderation really is what's key mm. so obviously you would need to be concerned if you had a kid who was becoming very I suppose upset if you were trying to reduce it even some little bit or had almost an an obsessive relationship with the online. So I think it's how it's used as opposed to the amount that it's used. And yes, safety always being relevant. And I would especially, you know, warn parents about invites from others and especially the younger, maybe the 11, 12, 13 year olds who might not have enough street savvy yet to recognize that a friend mm -hmm. of a friend might not in fact be a friend. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, basic internet safety applies as always, but not to get overly concerned about mm -hmm. excessive online at the minute. It's actually somewhat necessary. Yeah, absolutely. So again, again, just maybe having a, having a structure and an agreed set of rules or principles or what are you trying to have some some form of agreement with with the kids in the house that uh, it's a it's you know it's it, it's something that can be as transparent as it possibly can be obviously you can't watch everything all of the time i think we all know that and we're not naive enough to know that we can but it's just trying to have that framework in in place and yeah. uh, and, and bars would there be anything that, i don't know if there's anything you want to add to that from a sort of a you know the kind of the age of the the, the children that, that, that you obviously teach is there any any sort of advice that there or? no i would like to agree with what nolik said there i think i think parents should be very vigilant though and also i think i think don't be afraid to take the device off your child as well at night time and at bedtime pupils don't need phones in their bedrooms at night when they go no matter what they say and i think it i think we have to be parents as well and and decide you know you don't need it anymore at this time and i know that's not easy because you know they won't be very happy with us but i think you'll be doing the biggest favor to them and mm. i remember when i started teaching 37 years ago i remember we used to be saying for god's sake don't let your children watch too much television now we'd be saying will you for god's sake watch television <laughs> <laughs> you know because phones are so isolating you know what I mean? It, it, it's all. It's only them and the screen. At least when we watch television before, it used to be a family thing. But all yeah. I can say is just be vigilant. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's a very interesting point. We were having the same conversation in our household the other day about how, you know, even, even though I remember as a kid, you know, sometimes it might not be something I was particularly wanted to watch, but we'd all sit down and watch it. Yeah. And, and it was, I suppose, a bit more of a social thing. Now, again, probably a bit, bit naive to think we can always recreate that. But I think there is yeah. a role for that. And I think even in, even in trying to get something on the telly, it might be something on Netflix or something on, on one of the streaming services or something that everybody can sit down and watch. It's a good way. It's a movie or, or whatever, a couple of hours get just just it's a social thing breaks it out from that yeah. um that that isolated uh insular approach yeah okay I, I can see that we've got a couple of questions coming in so i might just fire a couple of that couple out now if that's okay um so we've had a question in which is in relation to masks and the wearing of masks in school uh the question is for when schools reopen will there be more mask breaks my child finds wearing uh, the mask all day difficult, and therefore there was and there was some talk of having a mask break or mask breaks, uh, but not but not happening in or it wasn't happening in his class. So again, um, I don't know, Sarah. Maybe you might yeah. want to um, pick up on that one first. Yeah, no, I can definitely come in here. So I suppose mask breaks are something that do happen in school but i think what the um what the the person is saying here is highlighting something that's really important and that is communication with the school um as a principal you know i have said to my staff masks and we need to build them into um class time and i'm going about my day and if nobody's telling me otherwise i'm assuming that they're getting enough mask breaks so I would say if your child isn't is struggling during the day and the class aren't getting enough breaks, I would say it's very important to contact either tutor or year head if you're if you're dealing with a post primary school or, you know, in, in primary school, I, I, it's probably slightly different. And to let them know that that's just a concern that you have or that it's something that they're finding difficult because mass breaks are incredibly important. It is very, very difficult for a child to wear a mask all day. We, we all understand that. Um, as an adult, it's difficult. So they do have that time in their, in, in their day and um, schools are very open to that, but they may not realise that there's a particular difficulty in a particular class. So I would say, you know, I never mind when a parent gets in touch with me to tell me something I appreciate. It's, I wouldn't be afraid about contacting um, the school to tell, to tell them that, you know? I mean, that's a good that's a good idea and just just letting parents know that that's 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 a channel no problem just just give you a call or send you a text or whatever it is um but bart anything from your point of view on that with the, with the young, younger kids and masks we don't wear oh, no, of course, sorry the yeah. children don't wear them of course teachers unfortunately have to yeah. wear them yeah yeah, yeah yeah no 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 indeed so it's not a concern at the moment at the moment yeah no yeah. absolutely um okay we i have um another question um so i have a child in primary and i'm concerned about the impact of lockdown on him he has additional needs 
and have been told that he is eligible for supplementary scheme uh, for a for a supplementary scheme for 20 hours in person teaching but we can't find any teacher or an sna to partake what, does anyone have any advice on how to find a teacher for the scheme uh, Bart, i don't know if that's something you have any yeah. insight on so unfortunately we're having the same problem at the moment trying none of our we've asked our staff none of our staff want to do which is understandable too but we've also got onto a number of substitutes and they're not really eager to do it either some of them are living with elderly parents and they don't want to be calling and visiting houses so i think that's going to be a difficulty unless the only thing is maybe during the easter holiday you can kind of bank all the hours and use them during easter it there might be a might be easier to find somebody at Easter time. Maybe that parent can contact um, the West Cork Education Centre in Dunmanway, and they might be able to help. Though, to be, though, even in saying that, I did notice an email from them yesterday. They were also sent out an email from another parent looking for that. So it's going to be a difficulty, I think. Okay. Calling, to, calling to people's house at the moment isn't something that people like to do. No, so 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 really, it's a case of again just trying to just trying to look ahead to 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 the return. Yeah, and maybe maybe Easter holidays there might be people willing to mm. do it then. Yes, yes, okay, okay. thank thanks, Bart. Yeah. Um, uh, Sarah, I don't know. Is there anything you you, you want to add to that or, or? No, um, I suppose. Look, we again would have a similar issue. So I think the only thing you can do is a contact the West Cork Education Centre. There's no harm in sending, I suppose, to to schools in general just to see. But I I would be surprised if there's an excess of staff. I think you might just need to give it some time and get a bit of confidence. I think if you saw schools reopening um, and staff going back to work, I think there'd be a bit more confidence and mm. people would be more likely. So like Bart saying, maybe if you just hang on to those Easter holidays, you could see, you know, people be with more confidence going into people's houses and that will improve. But at the moment, we're struggling as well. Str struggling, struggling to accommodate that. OK, thank you. And, and look, just to remind everybody who's who's on the webinar tonight that um, that they can type in questions. Um, so if you have a question, do do feel free to type it into the uh, to the question field. And uh, and obviously we'll we'll do our best to, to get through as many as possible. Um, there is another one that's come in, which is making reference to the fact that we were discussing the Leaving Cert. And obviously there's a lot of talk about the Leaving Cert for obvious reasons. But the question for the panelists here would be about the Junior Cert. And, and, and the questioner is asking how they're finding it very difficult to keep their 15-year-old uh, motivated. And, and there's a supplementary bit to that question about are the schools doing any pre's or planning to do any pre's? Um, yeah. So. Uh yeah, no, I can come in there. Well, first of all, yeah, I, I have to agree. I think the junior certs have been completely overlooked in all of this. Um, there's absolutely no talk about them whatsoever. If and I don't have any information, but if you were to ask me for my best guess, I would suspect that the junior cert probably won't be going ahead. And the reason that hasn't been announced is because they feel that there will be complete fall off. Um, now, not going ahead in the traditional sense. I mean, they will prioritise the Leaving Cert. I think there will be some form of in-school assessment, be, you know, what, what they'll be used to. Now, that's a guess. I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Um, so it is incredibly hard then to, to motivate them because I think kids are smart. They know that as well, and they know that there's nobody talking about it. With regards to pre's, I suppose it's very much up to individual schools to do at the moment. I um, have told my, my my students that I'm pressing pause on it, but I don't know what's going to happen with the Leaving Cert. And the Leaving Cert is a, I suppose the pre's are a trial run for the Leaving Cert. So if you if students are opting to do calculated grades, you have to ask the question, what's the value in doing the pre's? They could be used as data collection, but only if we're allowed to use the data. Last year, we were advised that we couldn't use the pre. So it's very hard to make decisions when there's so much unknown. So um, I've paused it. The other side of it is when schools do reopen, um, if you know coursework and practicals are going to be counted, that's where an awful lot of energy will have to go into, you know, particularly um, you know, um, DCG projects at leaving cert level, you know, they, they, they've gotten extensions and they will can that work can only be done in schools. So um, the pre's are very much up in the air. I don't know. Um, 
we had pushed ours out to the 22nd. We were planning on having them on the 22nd, which was late. Um, but I can't give any clarity around that at the moment. So I'm doing a lot of guessing. But at the moment, I'm thinking it's highly likely that a lot of schools won't do pre-exam. OK, that's interesting. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for, for explaining that in so much detail. Um, so um, maybe a question uh, for, for yourself, Nolik, if that's OK, which is which is. Um, are are you seeing any new or specific types of challenges or issues uh, coming out during this particular period now that that we haven't seen before? And 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 another and a supplementary bit to that question as well. Somebody mentioned to me earlier about you know whether or not there's any uh, a particular social impact that might be coming through here in terms of you know young people literally literally just missing missing that social interaction, missing their friends, not being with their their, their pals, etc. Uh, that or anything else coming through that you're experiencing? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, kids are desperately missing the the social side of things, but I don't know. There's a fine line between acceptance and kind of resigned to the, the fact that we just don't know what's going on. Um. So yeah, I mean, it comes up, and I think kids have been quite good as well with trying to create contact, which is online. Seeing a lot of young people, you know, using the Netflix, I don't think I'm not tech enough to know the name of it, where they're all watching the same thing at the same time and they're contacting and it seems to keep them going. Um, I suppose in terms of new presentations and, and a, a concerning thing that I'm seeing a lot, and I think it's been seen nationally as well, is teenagers, particularly teenage girls with eating difficulties. So restricting eating, excessive exercising. Not always weight related, but often, yes, more to do with just, I suppose, trying to exert a bit of control in a very out of control world. Um, so, yeah, that is somewhat concerning, um, but there would be levels as to how people would be impacted. For some, it's, it's minor, it's manageable, as mm -hmm. long as their parent is aware of what's going on, either through observation or being told. I think that can be dealt with quite easily well me easy mightn't be the right word but it can be dealt with but yeah i'd ask parents to be alert at the moment to evidence of serious restrictions or mm. increased exercise um, and as i say it's not just in my rooms i'm seeing it i'm hearing colleagues saying it and i think there has been national and uk reports about a big increase in eating distress and difficulty and if they and if they were worried about that or, or thinking that they should be worried about that, then obviously they could they could refer to someone like yourself and and, and get some expert feedback uh, about ways to to maybe to to, to handle that. And and, and not, would there be any you know at a sort of a more general level, if if you know any advice for parents who may be worried that just generally that their children are feeling not necessarily connected to education or to the leaving cert or whatever, although it could well be, but. But just generally at any age, they're feeling they're just feeling anxious. They're feeling um, a bit scared about this general situation. Any sort of basic advice for parents? Yeah, I think anxiety has certainly increased. And of course, any kids who had pre-existing difficulties with anxiety are definitely feeling it all the more because there's a high level of uncertainty. We have some very tired and overwhelmed parents, and understandably so. So again, as I would have said back in the other uh, webinar we did, it's self-care is key. So the more self-care and well-being that the parent is doing for themselves, the more available they are to the kid. And, and that, I think, makes it a lot more manageable. So mm -hmm. self-care mm -hmm. for parents primarily. But yeah, certainly I'm not sure the anxiety is necessarily increasing in general, but for those kids who had pre-existing difficulties, mm -hmm. it certainly has intensified and parents' yeah. own capacity to hold with that, of course, is compromised at the moment. Yes. Yeah. And 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 kind of advice around. I mean, would there be advice around just 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 taking the time to to talk to a child, to try and reassure them, just to try and, as you said, to try and keep calm yourself, keep the household calm. I presume all those things help in those yeah. situations. Without a doubt. And I suppose, interestingly, and somewhat counterintuitively, reassurance isn't always the best first protocol with a very anxious child. Mm -hmm. Reassurance certainly has its place, but when you think about it, if you're reassuring a kid who's feeling very, very overwhelmed, so they have all this activity inside their body, their heart may be going, their tummy may be turning, and if they hear words, you're fine, you'll be grand, don't worry about it, it, it can have what we would call an invalidating effect. So validation first, you know, comments like, I can see this is hard, 
I can see that you're struggling right now. This is awful, isn't it? You know, we're all in a difficult place right now. Now, we don't dive into see a despair or anything, but validation before reassurance, and then we can do a bit of problem solving. Um, so yeah, it's just about that initial response. I think validation is a very powerful tool that parents mm -hmm. can use, because once a kid feels heard, of course, that in itself can alleviate some of the Yes. Stress. Just even the ability to just talk about it in the first instance. Yeah, yes. and if somebody saying, I get it, you know, this is hard, I can see mm -hmm. finding this tough, and how could you not? This is yes. tough. Yes, yes. And then it's almost like a pause, and then we can look at, okay, what can we do? Mm. Let's go and do something distracting. Let's go and try and do something fun or relaxing or make a little plan to do something. So validation first, sit with it briefly, and then a move into problem solving. Okay. I'm going to keep you there now because because we've actually had another question specifically for yourself, if that's okay, which kind of relates to one of your answers a, a couple back again. But you you, you might you might have a, a little bit more you want to to add maybe or expand upon. So it says um, the question is um, I have a teenager who I feel is exercising excessively. Um, the, the 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 teenager was always into exercise, but I think it's becoming a problem at the moment. Would there be any advice? um as as they tend to shut down when i bring up the subject when i bring it up as an issue okay um and i suppose i there would be a few more bits of information that would be necessary to give i suppose a more comprehensive answer so obviously more generally speaking if you suspect your kid is exercising too much there's a fine line between what's healthy and what's unhealthy so there's the exercise and the impact of it. Is there any observable, visible weight loss? Is there any restricting or overly conscious behavior around food and excessive focus on healthy food or trying to skip meals or reduce portions? Um, but I suppose the, the key thing would be to look for the impact of the exercise. So are they getting frustrated if they can't do their exercise, if something gets in the way where there's an unhealthy relationship, there's almost a compulsion to do the exercise, uh, is there observable weight loss? So it depends really on what the consequences of the exercise are, um, which may be unhealthy or may not. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very fine line. So I think the key thing there for that parent is trying to have the conversation and realizing, again, I don't know what age this teen is. So a younger teen, older teen, you would take a slightly different approach, but in general to Avoid kind of direct questioning. And I think one of the best places to have hard conversations with teenagers is in the car. So it's non-threatening, there's no eye contact, it doesn't feel intense, you have the soothing movement of the car. And to maybe broach it as an observation or, you know, I'm noticing, I'm wondering. So curious. But of course, the parent needs to be contained as well and not like, oh my God, what's going on? Are you expecting too much? Are we in trouble? So a bit of self-regulation set, and I always recommend the car, and going curious and, you know, wondering, thinking, noticing, and trying to open the conversation. Again, yeah, it, having the conversation is key. It's key, yeah. Okay, now that's really good, really good advice there, Nori. Thank, thanks for that. Um, I, I, um, I, I just, I was just going to ask one more question of, of the teaching staff, and, and, and there doesn't seem to be any more questions that have come in at the moment from, from the audience. But again, feel free. We've got a few more minutes if anybody wants to fire a question in. But I mean, I suppose tonight we've talked about parents, we've talked about children, of, for obvious reasons. That's very much about what tonight is about. But I suppose just talking to the two, to the two teaching personnel on the panel, is there anything that you would like to say to, to any of your colleagues, uh, your counterparts that may be on the webinar tonight in terms of it's very important that teachers also take care of themselves and, and are in, in good shape. And this uh, this must be quite stressful for, for teaching staff as well. I don't know, Bart, whether there's anything you want to, to, to add to that? Yeah, this is the one question I hate, as I said to Ita before, anything to do with well-being and touchy-feely bits. It's not my strength, if you can ask my staff. but. I would say, first of all, we have a midterm break on Thursday and Friday. Enjoy it. This is coming to an end. There's no doubt about it in the next couple of weeks. And when we were coming back in September, it was kind of into the unknown. Now, I think when we come back in a couple of weeks time, it's going to be to the known because we've done this before and it has worked and it has worked extremely successfully. So I think it's positive. Coming back will be very, very positive. And of course, the best thing is just look after yourself 
And another thing, try and turn off the news because all they're talking about is how many cases, how many deaths. Also, is leaving cert happening in school? They can't stop talking about it. Turn off the news. Turn off your emails at night, which I've started to do, and at the weekend, all that. And I and don't read my emails either. But, but do keep buying the Southern Star, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, think, I think I think you're right, and even as someone in the media, I think you're right that that, that, that that it has to be managed because if if not, it can be a tidal wave of of of, oh, of yeah. I'm afraid negative news from the from TV, from radio, from from the papers generally. So it is about just managing the consumption, and especially for younger people as well. Oh yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bart. Sarah, okay. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to Bart's answer, and then I do have a question that has come in specifically for, for, for yourself. Um, yeah, I suppose what I would say to teachers is you're doing a good job um, and, and, and they should be pleased with them. You know, people are working really hard, and I think not all media, but a lot of the media like the notion of pitting parents against teachers. You know, when people talk about the vast majority, most of the parents, I have nothing but good things to say about teachers. You know, we all want the same thing. We want to help young people. We want them to reach their potential and to be happy and safe. We're all working towards the same thing. That's why teachers are teachers. That's why people have children. So um, I would say step away from that negativity. Don't kind of get caught up in that. It's not actually the case at all. The vast majority of people think they're doing a good job and just keep doing what you're doing. And um, and then, you know, it's hard um, teachers or parents. And I think, you know, um, something um, that's been said here tonight, you know, parents are exhausted. Like this is really hard in parents. Homeschooling is no joke, you know. And if you've got younger kids or teenagers, it's a different and you can have both. It's bloody hard. And I think everybody needs to be giving themselves a little bit of a pass. I think everyone's best not perfect it's not going to look perfect but we'll get through it you know and, and we just have to rely on each other and just kind of be kind to each other and be kind to ourselves give it give everyone a pass because they deserve it i think that's i think that's a very good point and very, very well said um the specific question that came in uh, for yourself was um i have a fifth year at home she is very dedicated and wants to do really well in the leaving cert do you think this broken up year, which is running into the summer, might affect their leaving cert year in autumn? Or is there time to catch up? 100% there's time to catch up. So I wouldn't be concerned about um, not covering content, particularly if you've got a motivated student. The, the truth of the matter is when a student is highly motivated, they will do the work. So it goes back to my earlier point, and it's what I'm, I say to everybody, like even to that, that parent who asked about their junior cert, learning for learning's sake is important. Like these students are going to leave school, they're going to go on to third level or apprenticeships and get jobs. What they learn in class is valuable and important and it will serve them well. If you're a very academic fifth year, you have plenty of time. Go to your online classes, be engaged. If you need, if you feel like you can do more work and you're not getting enough, ask for extension tasks. You know, teachers are probably trying to, you know, limit the amount of assignments they're giving because they, they realise it's tough. But if, if your child is able for more and they want more, ask for it there's no issue with that they'll get it and let them work away as long as they're happy with the pace and it, it's suiting them and in terms of going back next year look with the amount of vaccines and with everything i really hope that this disruption to learning will be you know this will be it so i'd be very confident that next year's six years will have a really good run at it and i go back to the point of no matter what they'll be looked after they will like that's the, that's the truth and um, it's brilliant that someone's managing to stay motivated through all that. So look, that's a real positive. Good, good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. OK, I think we've probably got time for just one more question, uh, which has just come in. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a, a tricky one. How, how do you keep them motivated at 15, 15 years of age? Um, they say to me, nowhere to go, no one to see. It's very difficult to coach them to go outside. Is this is this anxiety? Could it be agoraphobia? It is starting to cause disturbed sleep and some weight gain. So obviously a concerned parent there about their 15 year old. They don't say whether it's a boy or a girl, um, but uh, just difficulties in, 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 in motivating them. I, I don't know if anybody 
particularly would like to start on that one. Uh, whether Nolig, you might have any advice there or views? Yeah, I suppose we need to recognise that 15 year olds aren't the easiest to motivate in the best of times. I mean, it is a difficult age and that key piece that's missing from their lives, which is peer interaction and time away from that. So I suppose the thing with motivation is that there's no magic intervention that we can do. And within the psychological field, there is the saying that activation pre precedes motivation. So I would look at trying to get that kid to agree to small tasks, even if it's a short walk outside um, and just getting fresh air, even if it's to just sit in the garden in a sheltered place, obviously, weather permitting, but small achievable tasks initially. And really, I suppose, to try not to force them, but to get them to understand the value of it. Because if there is poor sleep, then activity is crucial. Or, you know, even if they were willing to do a bit of extra movement within the house with a parent or a sibling or, um, yeah, just small achievable tasks initially and try to convey to them the importance of keeping their body moving uh, to benefit their sleep. I suppose in terms of the weight gain, I wouldn't worry too much about initially, but obviously, you know, it's it's a symptom of something else for all of us in these times. I think I certainly am consuming more food than I have done, but we'll get away with it if we can balance it out with a bit of activity. So I yes. come at it more from the health and well-being perspective, move your body, get outside, benefit your sleep, benefit your mood, um, and then you can afford to eat the treats a bit more and not worry about it. Yeah, and, and 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 I think the the sleep is a key one, isn't it? But as we all know, well, you know, to sleep in teenagers is is a is a var variable feast uh, at the best of times. So I, I suppose you just have to roll with that a little bit as well. But but I suppose as long as they're trying to make sure they get some good core sleep in there as well. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I'm very conscious we're, we're pretty much out of time, so I think we'll probably start to wrap it up. And, and, and just before we, we uh, or I hand back to Ita, we might we might just finish off with literally just a comment, any thought you have. And I think maybe we try and finish on a positive, upbeat comment, uh, because I think ultimately, as we've said, the theme of this is that we've got to look forward. We will get through this. Hopefully, there, there's some light at the end of the tunnel now. Spring is just around the corner. So um, and any, any volunteers of our panelists who would like to just Throw a positive thought out to the audience to, to finish off the night. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go first and I'll just say, look, I, I have noticed a really big improvement on, on students online, you know, um, engagement in, in learning. You know, I, th I think that you're doing really well this time around and it's it's tough going, but I think it just goes to show that they're resilient. They can adapt. They have improved. And I do really, really strongly believe that they're absolutely going to be OK. They're not going to be disadvantaged in terms of their learning, that they will be absolutely fine at the end of this and they just need to keep doing what they're doing. And it will end. <laughs> exactly. It will. This will. It will pass. We will get through this indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Nolig or Bart, anyone fancy? Yeah, well, I would certainly echo what Sarah said and I suppose the message throughout. This will pass. We just need to hold with the uncertainty. And we need to know that kids are resilient, you know, uh, they will come through this much better than we actually expect them. And, you know, if, if people do need additional help, it is available and reach out, connect and talk to schools when you need to. I think we absolutely can do this and we are doing this and we will come through it. Thank you. Thank you, Norik and, and Bart. Basically the same thing, except another thing I've just noticed, too, is that teachers and parents have developed a much closer relationship than maybe they might have had before. Because I remember saying this before, on maybe on this platform, that we've been in everybody's houses and they've been in our house. You know, so I think that's going to be something that we can work on and build on over the months and years to come. I think it's going, I think it's going to be very positive because it's only been 27 days. And you've yeah. that, that. And I'd say we'll we'll be back soon. I mean, that's a really good point. And actually, if you think about it in terms of the, uh, the, the the technological competencies that have developed even just over the last 12 months amongst our young people and our teenagers and, and our teaching staff and our parents, you know, that's that's they're all they're all skills there in terms of communication skills and, and learning skills and uh, even that they'll they'll take on probably into their into their working lives for the future as well. So there are there are positives and benefits to to this definitely to to, to be seen out to be drawn out of this. I, I think I would just finish off by saying as well. I think it's important where possible to try and have a bit of fun as well. I think as you said.
say we can all get ground down a bit too much by the seriousness. And of course, there's a lot of seriousness about this very serious subject. But I think, you know, every now and again, you got to try and have a bit of fun. We put on Bonnie Tyler's uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart at full volume in our car the other day with the three kids in the back. My God, they were mortified. Me and my wife started singing it. But uh, you got to have a laugh, haven't you? You know, <laughs> because otherwise we'll all go a bit crazy. So listen, I just want to thank our three panelists. I know Ita, I'm going to hand over to Ita, who will, who will wrap us up properly. But uh, but Bart and Nolig and Sarah, thank you so much. Really useful, really insightful um, answers based on your experience which I know I always find valuable just to hear the answers you give. And I hope our, our uh, webinar attendees have also found that useful tonight. So um, I'll sign off and say uh, good night to everybody. And I'll hand back over to, to Ita to, to wrap us up. Great. Thank you, Sean. I'll just hold you for one one or two more minutes. Um, Sean, that was brilliant. We got through a lot of questions um, and moderated a great discussion. I think it's nice to have this format where it's more of a chat and a discussion. Um, you know, there's so much online where it's kind of coming at you. So we really made it engaging. Um, thank you so much to our panelists, to Sarah, to Barth and to Nolik. We're coming back a second time. We probably didn't think we'd be here again when we were at this last August. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I just want to thank the Family Resource Centres and mention them. They helped just promote this event. And there is Family Resource Centre in Demanway. There's one in Skibbereen. There's the Bear West in Castletown Bear. And there's the Cass Centre in Adrigal. And they are actually providing a lot of supports for parents in terms of homeschooling. I know in, in Castletown Bear, they will print stuff for parents who need it for homework at home, which is a really practical thing. So, you know, it's worth just looking them up and engaging and seeing what they have to offer. So I just wanted to, to mention them. To my colleagues in the National Learning Network for their support with this event, um, I want to say thank you. And to Devadas, he's there in the background. He provides our technical support and uh, keeps us all in safe hands dealing with technology that we're not quite used to. So thanks, Devadas. I just wanted to leave you um, as parents and our audience with a thought around your own health and well-being, and it's echoing what Nolik said. You know, your own self-care is so important, so that you have something left in the tank for your kids, and the more. I suppose calm and rested and fueled up and energized that you are by giving yourself that little bit of time and self-care, the more you'll be able to cope. We all know this, but it's hard to just put it into practice. And just to mention on our website, the wellbeingnetwork.ie, there are a lot of resources. There's some videos up there for parents advising them on you know getting through this time. Uh, it's worth looking at. And one thing I wanted to mention on the website, we have a section called the five ways to well-being and it's kind of our core philosophy at the Wellbeing Network. It's very practical, common sense stuff, but we have to rem be reminded it's a really good framework and it's around being active, connecting, you know, engaging and taking notice of what's going on around you, keep learning. We're all doing lots of that these days with new technology coming at us all the time. So it might be worth just looking up there to just give yourself those reminders and prompts to take that time and just look after your own well-being. And um, I'm going to leave it there with that thought for you parents. Look after yourselves. Go back to your pancakes if you haven't had them yet. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening and hope you have a very good evening. Thank you. Good night.